Now, you've been traveling. You were in Washington yesterday. You're in New York today. You're headed to Toronto next. You're here to speak about Malaysia's government and to urge support for it. What is your message to foreign government leaders and to foreign investors? Well, the, our experience is rather unique, phenomenal change. We uh, transform uh, autocratic uh, re regime into a vibrant democracy. And um, we promote market economy and uh, wanting to ref bring back Malaysia as an important destination for foreign investments. Bring back Malaysia, and that's interesting because obviously uh, the 1MDB scandal has been a bit of a setback for the country. Describe the impact that 1MDB has had on foreign investors uh, wanting to do business in Malaysia and with Malaysia. Well, the 1MDB is a key key point with the worst form of governance, a very corrupt system, and complicit to the crimes are, of course, the involvement of some international financial institutions like Goldman Sachs. So um, with this uh, ep episode, people tend to be about, about suspicious because of the system of governance and the way we do things. But I have to assure them, look, that was in the past. Mm -hmm. The system is now transparent. We are more accountable to our policies, uh, to, to our actions, in our actions, I'm sorry. And, and therefore, we must be given the chance. Um, this is not usual when people rise up, various communities, various races, come up and say, we demand change. We must not uh, co continue to support a corrupt regime. Now, part of that transparency and change, of course, is to hold people accountable. It's been seven months since the former Prime Minister, Prime Minister Najib Razak was charged, but the trial has yet to start. And this week, we saw yet another delay. Are you surprised by the delay? Does it signal anything? Well, I think um, this new uh, regime um, probably we need to uh, be more um, ready and uh, professional in our uh, preferring a charge. Mm -hmm. But this also reflects uh, a system that is uh, um, democratic and uh, that the judiciary is independent. In the past, we would just direct the judges. But now, uh, we have to respect the rule of law and due process. It is exasperating. The, the people expect a faster a quicker resolution. Some of the cases are so apparent and so clear. Mm -hmm. A prime minister receiving $2.6 billion uh, is not something which uh, is uh, acceptable. It's a personal donation into a personal account. So it is not a matter of proving a case. It's a matter of respecting the due process. Still, as you said, uh, it's taking a long time and it's frustrating for people. Najib is becoming a more sympathetic character. He's been very active on social media. Uh, he's been criticizing the government. And some say that he's regaining popularity. Do you worry that there will be a backlash against the government, especially when he says that um, the government has a political vendetta against him? Well, uh, Najib has enriched himself um, with the millions of dollars stolen from public purse. He can certainly, certainly employ more staff, more people supporting through the social media and some, some other arrangements. Mm. But that would not deter uh, the general Malaysian uh, people from uh, condemning uh, the atrocities of the past, the excesses of the past. And uh, we'll just have to wait what more can be uh, told through the courts. Now, when it comes to blame, how much of the blame do bad actors in Malaysia versus outsiders deserve for creating this 1MDB situation? Is it 50-50? No, I think the central, uh, the core uh, personalities are certainly the Prime Minister and his colleagues. Um, some are trying to uh, navigate their ways, trying to join the uh, ruling coalition. But I think the Anti-Corruption Commission has made very clear that this is not to cover up your crimes. You have to face the music. Uh, but other than this, of course, the players, the international financial institutions, are also at fault. I mean, you talk about business, you talk about commissions, you have a completely disregarding the rule of law, transparency, and whether the leader is corrupt or not. To some of the investors, the more corrupt you are, the easier you can, hmm. you do, we can do business with. We want to show that uh, a transparent system should be the option, the choice for investors.
Now, you mentioned Goldman Sachs earlier. Our audience wants to understand more about Goldman's involvement in 1MDB and what happens next. Give us an update because the finance minister, Lim, has said the government may drop criminal charges against Goldman if the firm pays $7.5 billion. Have there been any direct talks with Goldman Sachs? Well, there have been negotiations. Um, of course, since negotiations are taking place, I'm not uh, in the position to say more, but it's important to know what uh, excesses and crime they committed. Mm -hmm. I mean, to obtain $600 million commission and then to um, uh, execute the bond and then $2.6 billion return for Najib to, dis to play out uh, according to his own personal um, uh, whims and fancies. This is, of course, not something uh, which is no normal. It runs contrary to all financial rules and regulations. Now, whether we can uh, achieve uh, finally, the settlement uh, of 7.5 billion or not will depend on the stage of the negotiations. But I think I support the position of the government now. We will not compromise. Or they have not only stolen the money through commissions, but they have helped to destroy the economy and the confidence in the system. You, just, you said $7.5 billion or not. Is that $7.5 billion number a justifiable penalty, given that the entire bond deal was for $6.5 billion and Goldman, Goldman's take was a fraction of that? Would it make sense for them to pay the equivalent of the fees that they collected? You know, I, I leave it to the authorities, uh, the team, to decide the quantum. But uh, what is important to realize is that they were complicit to the crime. They, uh, the, the effect being the whole image of the country, the confidence of investors, and now the state of the economy. They must bear responsibility. So you reject the argument that it was a few bad apples in the firm? Well, um, for such a uh, figure and uh, probably the highest commission that they've got, it's not um, feasible or tenable to assume that the entire and uh, top personalities in Goldman Sachs is not aware. Now, should Malaysia safeguard itself in any way against foreign banks, against foreign institutions, foreign players? No, we have adequate uh, um, safeguards and policies and regulations. This, um, however, however uh, rigid the safeguards, if you have crooks running uh, the system, they can always navigate. So it is important to have institutions and rule of law and to have uh, credible leaders with very high ethical standards. I need to ask you about China because China is also heavily invested in how 1MDB gets resolved. Its position here is kind of tricky though. What kind of relationship do you want to see between China and Malaysia as the Malaysian government works to resolve 1MDB? Well, China is not involved or directly or complicit to the crimes of MDB. I mean, they were brought in, if at all, at the last stage to try and resolve part of the funding, through part of the funding. But we have made it very clear to China, they remain a very important partner in trade and investments, and we want to work very closely with China. But then they have to accept the fact that this is a new democratic government, very transparent, and we are accountable to our people, which means the initial, uh, the original project the railway ACRL project must be reviewed mm. because we cannot defend the uh, original cost. Now, if the, uh, we can achieve this understanding that the price is acceptable, normal, transparent, and the project would uh, benefit also local contractors, then we can proceed. And you're referring, of course, to the infrastructure deals that China struck with Najib. Um, you talk about transparency. Let's get some transparency on your own plans, uh, Mr. Anwar. You are referred to as Malaysia's prime minister in waiting. What's the timeline for you to become prime minister? You see, um, there was an agreement between um, among the party leaders. It's not just Anwar and Mahade um, uh, that I will assume office at the right time. Now, um, why don't we then fix a date? You know, in my discussions with Mahathir, I want him to be effective. Mm -hmm. I want him to be given the latitude to govern effectively. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we cannot give an immediate date. Would you be happy to wait five years? No, of course it's not five years because he has made it very clear that he will not exceed two years. And, and, but it's important to allow him to govern effectively. 
because we are in a very difficult uh, and trying, trying times. You know, I have to say I'm a bit puzzled by your alliance with Dr. M because he was your mentor, then he was your enemy after he betrayed you in the 1990s. He was also a mentor to Najib before turning on him. Why do you believe that Mahathir will do as he says and step aside for you within two years? What's different this time? Scarlett, between Anwar's personal predicament, the suffering that my wife and my children had to endure, and the country, the future of the country, the interests of the country must override, must take precedence. That I have to concede, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, Mahade has shown that he w was and is prepared to take the blows. And uh, during the period year or so before the elections, they went after him hard, and uh, now he. And then he was also committed to some of the reform agenda. He um, was given, I mean, the support because of his commitment to support the reform, which means judicial independence, free media, market economy, etc. So I think, therefore, however difficult it is, I must uh, concede. Mm -hmm. that uh, this uh, collaboration will be of great benefit to the people in Malaysia as a whole. So you'll be patient and have faith. We've heard, though, that the Prime Minister is considering a cabinet reshuffle. Is that the case? And if so, what are, what are the reasons for him to do so? You see, the formation of the cabinet is the discretion of the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. I have said to him that um, I am staying out uh, and so that he has the space and attitude. But generally, I mean, of course, if he is going to have a reshuffle, he will have to consult party leaders. But he has said very clearly he has no interest to uh, have a reshuffle. Mm -hmm. And I take his word for it. I want to get a sense of how you would, your government would rule differently. Uh, the new government's focus is really to clean up corruption, to rectify bad behavior. And under Mahathir, the government has banned, for instance, Israeli athletes from entering Malaysia later this year. And these are athletes that want to compete in a qualifying event uh, in Sarawak for the 2020 Paralympics. Israel says that this is anti-Semitism. Is that a fair characterization? And as Prime Minister, how would you handle this? See, Mahade made it very clear. It's not anti-Semitic. He said, we have exhausted all avenues expressing our concern for the plight of the Palestinians. We are not against Jews. We have never taken a position against any race. But uh, Dr. Mahade made the right decision because he said he has exhausted all avenues at least to convey, to stop the atrocities against the Palestinians. And you can't take it this as anti-Semitic. These are athletes, though. N nevertheless, let, let's move on to the economy because, of course, economic concerns top of mind for voters in Malaysia and certainly investors in Malaysia as well. Talk about what Malaysia needs to do in the next five years to increase its economic competitiveness. Well, other than transparency and good governance, we must then look at all possibilities. Uh, to ensure that we remain competitive and able to attract foreign investments. Mm -hmm. Rules, efficiency, ease of doing business, and focusing on the major uh, categories of business that we would like to encourage, for example, digital economy, um, services sector, uh, high-end technology uh, in manufacturing sector. When these issues uh, will be, have to be made clear and we have to explain and efficient in executing these policies. Now, last question to you, and I ask this because I was in Hong Kong in 1997. You were the finance minister of Malaysia during the 97 Asian currency crisis. And in retrospect, people say that Malaysia came out of it better than other countries, in part because Mahathir imposed capital controls. What is the lesson that you think we can take away from that period as we continue to deal with the fallout from the uneven growth that stems from the 2008 global crisis? You see, the issue is more complex. For example, Malaysia stands unique because there was a budget deficit before that. And there was budget surplus before that. Mm -hmm. It stands unique because we have even prepaid more than 2 billion ringgit in the years. 
So because of the strength of the fundamentals and the funds at our disposal, we were never compelled to seek um, the funding from IMF as a last resort. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore, the measures undertaken uh, according to Mahathir's recommendations did work. But if our economy has been rotten uh, with huge deficits, um, I don't believe any measure would help. Is that a blueprint for how we should tackle crises in the future? Yes, which means we have to prepare now, not wait for the turbulence to happen. We have to have a, a resounding, strong fundamentals and uh, manage our economy well.